Well, I do remember that it, that it was March of the 10th, 10th was the first day when, when I was shut down. It really happened. I was thinking like three months at the latest. Then needless to say, it took longer. How do I put it to words? Let's see. Uh, it's just, it's just so surreal to me. I'm lucky to be, I'm thankful I'm alive. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that it was going to last over a year. We have known that, you know, we can get information at nine o'clock in the morning and it can change by two o'clock in the afternoon. I can see the panic in stuff, you know, in the stuff's eyes. I felt like I was preparing or helping her kind of go to battle. My heart was pounding and um, I just remember, you know, breaking this news to them that, you know, their lives were going to change. I remember very clearly there was a, um, a woman who would come to visit her husband every day for a good portion of the day and having to share with her, I'm so sorry, but after tonight, I, you know, we have to restrict your visits. And at that time, we thought it would be two weeks. We were telling everybody, you know, for the next two weeks, we're gonna see sort of what happens because that was the guidance we got. And, you know, then we'll take it from there. So many of our families come in on a daily basis or bring in their loved ones food or, help them with their laundry. I mean, there was, initially there were so many of those little questions. Um, and obviously as we progressed further on, um, it, it, there became bigger questions, but yeah, it was a big, it was very, very hard for them to sort of understand how this was gonna play out, you know, and no one really knew. The first thing that came to mind was that it would not last three weeks, maybe a month, um, never in my wildest dreams did I think that it was going to last over a year. And if you would have told me that, I would have thought you were completely crazy. Um, the thought that people would be isolated for a year without family, I just never, ever dreamed when they first told me that families were not going to be allowed in the building and that residents were confined to their rooms, that it would last as long as it has. I remember when um, we first told the residents that they would have to stay in their room. We had called this huge neighborhood meeting and um, we brought them all to the lobby area and myself and um, Jessica from social services, we, you know, uh, told the residents about what would, you know, be taking place and how they would go from at that point, you know, they were they were supposed to stay on their floor only um, to having to be in their rooms. And I I could barely stand, I could stay standing. I, I had to, I had to sit down and um, I, you know, grabbed a stool and I sat down and my heart was pounding. And um, I just remember, you know, breaking this news to them that, you know, their lives were going to change. And we weren't allowed to go out of our rooms. I thought, okay. But after a couple of weeks, then you get like, oh, when is this going to end? When it first hits, you go along and make the best. You watch TV and, you know, talk to AIDS and try to do what you can. But then you start to mind drifting and start reminiscing of a lot. Then you, then you start getting cheery and missing everyone of your family. You want to see them. So that was one of the biggest things needing to see your family. Well, I do remember that it, that it was March of the 10th. The 10th was the first day when, when I was shut down. It really happened here, here. And I had an outside appointment that day, which I went to. But I do recall the 
that time that you were starting, that 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 uh, the doctor's office where I went to, they were starting to have the sanitizers and take some steps in his office at that time. Either, so I was I was scared. Yeah. It was very scary. Yeah. I was scared of that. I didn't think I was coming back. Yeah. June twenty third is when I got it, and then shortly after that, they sent me out. I still remember our first two cases. It's around 10 o'clock in the evening, and I got a call that we have our first COVID positive uh, patient. So 20 minutes after that, I received another phone call. I had another positive residence. Both of them came in one, from one unit. I remember driving in here at 11 o'clock at night, and um, I can see the panic in stuff, you know, in the staff's eyes. I got in the car in the middle of the night and, and we came here and I, one of the most poignant moments for me in all of this, and I might get emotional, was that night helping the nurse put on her um, head covering and her shield. Um, it almost felt like you were preparing someone for a strong fight or a battle or, you know, like, even a football coach would do, you know, when they put the helmet on. I felt like I was preparing or helping her kind of go to battle. And so there was a sense of, of fear there for that, but it was also a little bit of a sense of pride that we had those um, access to that PPE. We were very prepared. But then when that um, the actual thing happens, it's it's a different story. Everybody was afraid, I think, at certain certain points of the pandemic. Um, the only thing I could do was bring us all together and, and try and be as open and as honest. And so I, I was always very forthright. I shared the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and I think there was some strength in that. We converted 12 rooms, 12 Medicare rooms, into the COVID unit. We factored in paths coming in and out where the PPE room is going to be, where the break room is going to be, where the donning and doffing area is going to be. Um, we purchased 12 continuous pulse oximeters, bedside continuous pulse oximeters, camera in every room to decrease resident and staff exposure. I know that I cannot underestimate the skills and the resiliency of, of my nursing staff. They face challenges such as learning new technology, you know, PPE, wearing the N95 for eight to 16 hours, you know, they have sores in their faces as a result of that. Um, but they stop, they never stop. I wouldn't call obtaining PPE here at the care center as a difficult challenge for us. We started in early February. Um, we, we sat as a group and talked about what we needed and what we would have access to. We already knew our vendors were stretched. We already knew we had a high volume of residents and staff here. Um, so we started trying to think about what could we use as PPE if their normal PPE wasn't available. The Compassionate Care Program um, is one, and it's sort of evolved a little bit. Um, we were doing some compassionate care visits in particular over the summer and into the fall months and, and we would have like outdoor patio time where we would set up with the families um, a time for them to come in to to visit in our garden area you know they had to have the um, mask on the resident had to have a mask on they had to be socially distanced but they would be able to you know hold hands touch i'm really so grateful that we're able to have those because I think it's hugely important to be able to at least offer that. One of the biggest difficulties um, is, you know, you're given this little time frame um, in which you're, you're able to speak with, you know, your mom, your dad, your husband, and we say, it can happen on Tuesday and Friday from this time to this time, you know, and it's it's hard. But I think the biggest challenge has been that this has gone on for such a long time and to not be able to, you know, just hold their hand or rub their back. I think that has certainly been um, one of the biggest challenges. And of course, we all feel that, you know, we all feel that, um, 
that sadness that goes along with just not having that connection. Well, the main, the main thing that it's done for me is not being able to see family, to be with family. That's my biggest, the love of my family to, to be with them and go outside with them and joke around with them. You can still do that on the phone, but it's not the same as being right there in the presence that you could, you know, they can give you a hug and then it's all right. I miss the music program that miss going downstairs and I mean, I just miss that so much. I can't wait to get it back. We have a lot of residents that are um, sensory based in their activities and that can become really difficult to do when you don't have the ability to reach out and you know touch them or hold their hand or dance with them um, when that when you're not supposed to do those things and it's not safe for that to happen um, that's that's been a, a big change um, you know the power of of touch the power of music and the power of you know dancing with someone um, has been you know, something that's so important to so many of our residents. And um, it's just been, a, I guess, a matter of adapting that and figuring out different ways to do that. I used to help to deliver here all the, all the papers and all the mail and different things. And so I would do that every day. I, I would be around the entire building. All of all the floors and I got to see people, the staff and residents, residents and talk to them and and it was always something something that I you know looked forward to and I enjoyed doing. It gave uh, like a special purpose here and a meaning. I would do uh, all the big musicals, all the shows that they did. The volunteers come and sing. I would go to all those. I went to win the pets. They had turtles that came. They had dogs that came. So fun to see all the pets. That was really nice too. I think the biggest thing that I've done is learn how to take some of their old favorite programs and to uh, adapt them to room to room, um, adapt them so they could be done room to room. Um, so say for my bingo program, I will um, utilize technology, um, utilize other residents that are able to partner up with residents that aren't able to voice their bingos that they get. Um, and so using partnership technology, um, cheering them on, encouraging them, and finding out strategies that will help them to be able to participate in hallway group settings um, at a distance or um, finding ways to do an activity over and over and over again in, uh, by a room. Um, so that's a, the biggest difference is totally different strategy and how to accomplish this maybe the same program. You'll be watching TV and you get tired of that. And then you have an activity. It's like, oh, good, I get to go do, this. go do this. And then I made friends with the workers and the people that are on my floor. So it's nice. We move into our fall festival, which is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Never in our wildest dreams did we think that still we would be on quarantine. But here we were, going into our fall festival, and it all had to be done virtually. We were very worried, very worried. We thought, how would the fall fest survive this? And here we almost did as well. Our community is nothing but fantastic. And 
I believe in them wholeheartedly and they must believe in us. We also had a virtual art show. The residents did art all year and the families could see their art online as well as a virtual car show and a virtual um, craft show. We did a fashion show for the residents. So the staff got very creative and we went through all the hallways and did a fashion show for them. Our Christmas events, um, we were very worried because those are our biggest events of the year. And so we were very nervous. I truly think my staff did a phenomenal job. They had decorated um, flatbeds into sleighs. We're going down the hallways with these sleighs and the presents were on the sleighs and they were, you know, staff dressed up as Santa Claus and made it so fun for the residents. We did ice cream carts, we did snack carts, we did concession carts, anything that we could do to make, you know, the residents have these extra treats and different fun things that they could have throughout the week. When I think back on the programs that I have done in the last year, all while wearing full PPE, which has been quite the challenge. Um, but I think about the dance parties that I've had on my floor, uh, the arts and crafts that we've um, had so much fun doing from room to room, um, how my residents were featured on um, CBS News for the Pets Together program that they were involved in, where they were able to have in-room pet visits using our iPads that we have had donated, and making a music video with all of our staff and all the residents on my floor uh, to the song We Will Rock You by Queen, assisting families in celebrating milestones like 100th birthdays, uh, doing coloring contests and uh, swimsuit competitions where we would color swimsuits, doing room to room activities where residents could, you know, bring the outdoors inside where we would be throwing snowballs in the hallways, doing rock star karaoke from room to room, trying to celebrate every holiday to the nth degree celebrating Valentine's Day, Easter, Christmas. I, it's, it's hard to, it was hard for me to recall those things. And that's primarily because um, my motivation to do programs was not, uh, to do big and amazing programs was not something that I did for myself. It was something um, that I felt such um, in my gut, such an honestly pressure to do to bring the residents enjoyment because I knew how much they had to be struggling here. And um, I can tell you that day after day, I know so many people from the recreation department, uh, you know, went home feeling like they didn't do enough. And um, you know, thinking about the residents that we've left when we've left the building, how they had to stay there, but we got to leave. Um, and that really was what motivated us so much to continue to plan some of these bigger programs that we did. And um, and I hope, I think, and I think at the end of the day, we can all say that we did the best that we could. And I think the residents um, really appreciated everything that we did. I hope so. <laughs> I honestly can't say enough about my staff here. They are honestly some of the most creative people that I've ever worked with. And I don't know how they come up with some of the things that they do. I truly love working with them every day. Their energy and their creativity is completely infectious. I come to work every day looking forward to working with them. And I truly enjoy what I do. And it's because of them, it truly is. I will tell you some of my darkest days were thinking of the residents stuck in their rooms. And I really went up and down, 
whether I could continue to do this, but I knew that the work recreation therapy was doing was so mean meaningful and we had to keep going and we had to keep coming because we were what was going to help them get through this. There were a lot of moments um, to be proud of. I felt empowered each time a COVID positive resident comes out of the COVID unit. Seeing them coming in there very sick, then they're able to come out um, successfully beaten the virus um, makes, you know, gives me the empowerment. The same way the unit comes out of isolation. When they come out of isolation, and I can see in their faces that they do not have to wear, you know, the hot PP all over them. It's, 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 it's very, um, it gives me, you know, the drive to, to continue. Above all, I am, I am very proud, you know, it, I'm very proud to be, to be a nurse. At the beginning of COVID, it was unclear whether recreation would be essential um, in my mind. Um, when you think of, when you, you know, when we realized how um, COVID was going to impact this entire country and it, you know, we were, and I know myself, I was afraid to go to a grocery store or um, even to come to work at that time. I, I didn't know whether recreation would be essential, um, but I think it has been. And I think it's it's noted that when you, you know, talk to a resident um, and they, all, the only, some of the only good things that they can be, you know, thankful for in their life is the programs that we offer here. Um, that means everything. Reuniting families and friends with residents and, um, you know, those, uh, the golf outing that we do every year and the um, fall fest that we do every year, those are a lot of effort. And, and sometimes I'll be honest, we all dread them because of the planning that goes. We have, uh, give me a, I'll take a fall fest and a golf outing <laughs> every week because you just miss that, you know, that joy and, and, and pleasure that the residents have with those in, um, activities. So uh, certainly, getting back to reopening. You know, the, the care center has been here a long time, has a very strong history. It's gonna be here in the future. There's a definite need for high quality, you know, care to, to res seniors in, in this, um, this county. And so um, that's, our, that's our mission. My hope for the future is that um, this vaccine continues to do the wonderful things that it is doing. I really believe in it. I believe that our facility has been COVID free since we've gotten the second shot. Um, so I believe it's working. Um, so I hope that it continues. And what I hope for the families is that, um, that they have freedom. They deserve to be able to come and visit their families when they want. And I hope within the next few months they get that. Um, it's time, enough is enough and I think it's time.